Leia here from The Disabled Reporter, and I'm back with another video in my diagnosis discussion series. Today, I'm going to talk about my diagnosis of hypermobility spectrum disorder. But what is hypermobility spectrum disorder? Hypermobility spectrum disorder is a group of disorders that have to do with hypermobility. What is hypermobility? It is the passive extension of joints beyond where they need to be. So that means that if your joint is like this is passive, you can bend it back, but you can bend it back way more than this for a pinky. You can bend it, you know, to here, 90 degrees. An example of something that would not be considered a passive range of motion would be this. Because for me, I'm actively doing it. Instead, when a doctor is testing how hypermobile you are, they are trying to do it themselves to physically manipulate the joint to see if it will bend backwards to that level versus you trying to do it yourself. One thing I want you to keep in mind throughout this video is that for me, my joints that are hypermobile are my elbows, my knees, and my hips. So while my fingers are not technically hypermobile, I'm still going to use them as an example when I talk about hypermobility, even though, as I said, this isn't quite hypermobility. On the hypermobility spectrum, there are technically eight different conditions. However, there are actually only five disorders and three other conditions, those three conditions are the asymptomatic conditions. Those are asymptomatic localized joint hypermobility, asymptomatic peripheral joint hypermobility, and asymptomatic general hypermobility. Now, what these mean is that you do have a joint that bends past where it's supposed to, but you don't have any symptoms, you don't have pain, you don't have dislocations. So when we move into the actual hypermobility spectrum disorders, we see four that are classed as hypermobility spectrum disorder. Those are localized hypermobility spectrum disorder, peripheral hypermobility spectrum disorder, historical hypermobility spectrum disorder, and generalized hypermobility spectrum disorder. So when you look at hypermobility spectrum disorder, what you're really looking at is the hypermobility component plus the pain or dislocation component. A question that is often asked is, what is the difference between hypermobility spectrum disorder and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? Specifically, the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And the answer to that is basically, we don't know. So what we do know is that there is a section of people with hypermobility spectrum disorder, specifically generalized hypermobility spectrum disorder, that likely do have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but they do not meet five of the 12 criteria for hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. I myself meet three and a half of the five criteria. I'm going to make a video on hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, even though I don't have the condition where I talk about this more, but the 12 signs are essentially taken from classical Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and Marfan syndrome. I myself believe that there is a section of people with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that actually have Marfan syndrome. It's just that we have not identified a gene to be able to put those people under Marfan syndrome. One important thing to note is that the difference between the four types of hypermobility spectrum disorder is the joints that are impacted. The main way that we test joints for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is called the Baten criteria. The Baten scale is essentially testing nine joints. It is testing both pinkies, both thumbs, both elbows, both knees, and it is also testing your hips and back, but they are tested as one. So for example, I am able to hyperextend my elbow as well as my knees and touch the floor with my hands. That gave me a Bain score of five, which qualifies me as having generalized joint hypermobility. However, someone who can only hyperextend their pinkies 
would still technically qualify under peripheral joint hypermobility and if they have symptoms that would classify them as such, they could be diagnosed as having peripheral hypermobility spectrum disorder. The only thing is that you do not have to be hypermobile to have hypermobility spectrum disorder if you are an older adult or if you've had extensive surgeries. My knees technically are not completely hypermobile to the 10 degree mark. However, it is believed that because I've had multiple surgeries to fix my miserable malalignment syndrome, video on the card, that I lost hypermobility in my knees. My knees used to be extremely hypermobile, but now they are not so much just because of the changes that have been made in my knees. One common misconception that I hear a lot and I want to clear up is this idea of 20% of the population being hypermobile. What that means is that 20% of people have hypermobility in one joint. It does not mean that 20% of people are hypermobile in five or more joints, which is where you hit generalized hypermobility spectrum disorder. If you are able to pass the Baton criteria, then you probably do have some type of issue going on. Because it is true, it is possible to stretch out a few joints, but the idea that joints all over your body are going to have been stretched out, that is where it tends to be believed that there is something going on. It tends to be believed that that is hereditary versus the rest of joint hypermobility spectrum disorder, which could be genetic, but it could also be environmental. According to the geneticist that I saw at the University of Iowa, it is currently believed that hypermobility spectrum disorder is passed down in the same way that Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is passed down, that being an autosomal dominant passing down. So that means that if I have children, that 50% of my children will have hypermobility spectrum disorder. Now that I have told you what hypermobility spectrum disorder is, I want to talk about how I am affected. In my case, I have routine subluxions in my knees. I also sprain my ankles frequently because I have extremely loose joints in my ankles. My joints are so loose that I actually have special ankle braces that make it to where I cannot sprain my ankle because my ankle is essentially in a walking boot at all times. In these braces, it's impossible for me to roll my ankle because my ankle is essentially like this. If you think of this as my foot and my leg, there is a brace keeping it in this area. And so then I have the flexion of my toes, but not of my ankle. I would say that the main way that I am affected is pain. I do have pain in many of my joints. My most problematic areas for pain would definitely have to be my knees, my jaw, and my elbows. I'm a little bit unique, or at least I think perhaps unique, in that the small joints that are tested in the criteria are not hypermobile for me. When people talk about hypermobility, there are two classic signs that kind of define hypermobility. These are not the only signs and not everyone will have these signs, but you generally see the thumb going to the forearm or both hands being able to touch the floor with your legs straight. I can touch the floor with my legs straight, even though my flexion is greatly impacted by the fact that I am overweight. Despite being significantly overweight, I can still touch my hands to the floor. I can actually touch my palms to my heels. My pinkies do not meet the definition of hypermobile. This pinky is not really hypermobile at all, and while this pinky certainly does extend further than it should, it doesn't quite meet the 90 degree angle. However, when you look at my distal joints, which are the first joint, you can see that all of my distal joints do bend back 90 degrees. It's the same thing with my thumb. I have hitchhiker's thumb on both, which basically means that my thumb comes backwards quite a bit. However, I cannot get my thumb to touch my forearm. Hey guys, Leia here, and I am filming this as I'm editing the video, as you can tell because of my horrible hair. What we are gonna talk about 
is that this is the outro of the video because I realized that I didn't film an outro. So thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you found it helpful and leave a comment down below if there's anything that you want to know that I didn't include in here or anything that I didn't make super clear. Now on the end screen, I am going to leave a link to my miserable malalignment syndrome video if that video is done. And regardless of whether or not it's done, I am going to be putting a link to my whole diagnosis discussion series. Alright, until next time guys.